one of the really big jobs in this country, one that goes on every day of every year, is the raising of livestock and the preparation and distribution of meat. To produce the livestock and to move it from where it is raised and prepare it for the nation's millions of people to eat is a job which keeps more people busy than any other industry in the United States. This is the story of the people in the livestock and meat pack industry and the methods used to get meat from the livestock producers to the consumers. Cattle, lambs and hogs are raised in all sections of the country. Because the big livestock growing areas are far from great centers of population, meat must travel an average of more than a thousand miles before it reaches our dinner table. To begin with, there is the open range. Throughout the United States are huge areas of land suited largely to growing hay, grass, and such feeds that people cannot eat. In reality, cattle, lambs, and other livestock are grass turned into meat. In addition to utilizing grass, which otherwise would be wasted, livestock provides us with our finest nutritional food, meat. It is through livestock that the majority of America's farmers and ranchers find the chief means of marketing grass and forage crops, which otherwise would have no value as food for human use. The West, pictured in romance and stirring American history, is still the traditional home of cattle and cowboys. Two-thirds of our livestock is raised west of the Mississippi River, while two-thirds of all the meat is consumed east of the Mississippi, where the great majority of our people live. Sheep by the millions also are a part of the western scene. The high pastures of Colorado and Wyoming, the plains of Texas, the desert, range, and forest lands of all the western states provide forage for sheep and lambs. The sheep herder with his camp outfit, moving far from civilization, cares for his band of sheep and lambs in areas where little else will grow but vegetation which can be used by meat animals. In addition to cattle grown on the deserts, western ranges and forest lands, there are the cattle which come from farms all over the United States. Great progress along this line is being made in the southern states. Four million of America's nearly six million farms and ranches raise cattle. Field calves from dairy farms add much to the nation's total supply of meat. Thousands of general farms, in addition to the big western ranches, are raising lambs to satisfy American appetites, as well as wool for the nation's clothing. Corn and hogs must be included in any story of meat. Pigs are raised on most American farms, adding much to the total farm income. They are in greatest numbers in the Corn Belt states. There, hogs are fattened on corn and then shipped to market. Approximately 43% of the corn crop is fed to hogs, which make hams, lard, pork chops, and bacon. The movement of meat animals to market at the right time, quickly, and without injury or loss of weight is one of the biggest jobs in the industry. Train men and truckers have a big part in this important job, for it is a long road to market and meat must be kept on the move. The first stage of the journey from the range is usually to one of many central markets, such as the stockyards in Omaha, Denver, Kansas City, St. Paul, or Sioux City. 
Here, many of the range cattle are sold to feeder farmers who will fatten the animals, putting on the added weight and finish which they could not get on grass alone. In the stockyards, each rancher's animals are kept separate from the others and generally are consigned to a commission man who will act in the rancher's behalf. The commission man makes the sale either to cattle feeders who are looking for the type of animals he has on hand or to dealers who will regroup and classify them to suit the needs of other farmer buyers. Some are buying yearling steers or calves and some are buying cows. Some buyers are looking for certain weight cattle to take to feedlots. Some ranchers and farmers are buying lightweight stockers to put back on grass and later return them to market. Buyers are found for them all. Once again, they are on the move. This time going to feedlots where the finishing of cattle and lambs is a highly scientific branch of the livestock business. Most feedlots are located in the rich grain raising lands. Here, carefully balanced grain, mineral and protein feeds give the animals the desired finish. The fattening of cattle, sheep and hogs contributes much to the economic welfare and security of the farmers and ranchers, for approximately one third of their total cash income is from the sale of these animals. Through newspapers, radio and telephone, the producer has access to information on the supply and demand for livestock and meats at principal markets in his own area and throughout the United States. Market conditions and current prices of livestock and meats, compiled by the United States Department of Agriculture, are sent out daily. Hog prices yesterday moved up slightly from last week's close. Some classes registering 25 to 50 cent gains. A 25 cent advance also brought... To all this information, the producer adds his own best judgment and experience to make the all-important decision as to where and when to sell. Whether it is a thousand lambs from the range, a single calf or steer, or a few head of hogs, he can take them or send them to market at any time. There are many variations in the way the producer sells his livestock. Sometimes cattle and lambs are sold direct to feeder buyers without going through a central market. Sometimes cattle and lambs come fat off the range or farm and are sold through the central market to a meatpacking plant or are sold direct to the meat packer. Hogs usually make only one trip to market, either from the farm, through a central market, or direct to the meat plant. Veal calves also are marketed at the central stockyards, or they too may be sold direct from the farm to the meat packing company. So, by a method of marketing chosen by the livestock producer, which he thinks will bring him the most cash, animals come from the ranches and farms and feedlots all over the nation. A large part of the livestock comes through the central markets on its way to the meat plants. There are more than 60 central markets in the United States. Some of the better known are located in Chicago, Denver, East St. Louis, Fort Worth, Kansas City, Omaha, St. Joseph, St. Paul, and Sioux City. A huge stockyards is a city within a city. Hundreds of acres of land completely devoted to the handling of livestock regular livestock hotels. The various stockyards are not owned by the meat packers, but by companies whose business is to provide men to handle the animals, pens, scale houses, and feed and water for the livestock. The owners of the livestock pay the stockyards companies for these services, and pay the commission men for selling their livestock. Here is a whole population steeped in the traditions of the yards, grown up with it, having its own mannerisms, its own customs, and rich with its own local color.
trains and trucks pour their livestock into the yards every day. Commission men and others gather to check up on the arrival of livestock consigned to them and to find out at what platform or dock their livestock will be unloaded. Up to the minute bulletins by the Department of Agriculture show the day's receipts and livestock prices at the various principal terminal markets. Weather conditions, which have an influence on the movement of animals to market and the demand for meat, are reported. In addition, the government reports the daily wholesale prices meat packers are receiving for beef, lamb, pork and veal of various classes and grades. Many meat packing plants are located around these central markets. Their buyers and representatives of distant meat packers compete with one another for the farmers and ranchers' livestock. The extent of this competition is realized when one knows that more than 18,000 meat packers and other commercial slaughterers of meat animals are listed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Buying and selling goes on daily in the pens, with the many buyers looking over the cattle and making their bids. Buyers representing meat packing companies contact the commission men who represent farmers and ranchers. The commission man's greatest interest is to serve his customers well. Trading between the commission men and the meat company buyers is based on what retail meat buyers are paying for meat and the price meat packers are receiving for byproducts. Therefore, the price the producer receives for his livestock is governed by what the meat packer can get for the meat and the byproducts. In this huge central market, in others like it across the country, buyers are seeking livestock for hundreds of meat plants. While it is true that all these concerns do not buy livestock in every market, it is also true that none of them can operate without coming into close competition with numerous other livestock buyers. When the commission man is satisfied, he is getting the highest possible price for a particular lot of cattle, the deal is made. Then the cattle are on the move once more. This time they're headed for the stockyard scales to be weighed. The weighmaster operates the delicate scales which are inspected frequently by the Department of Agriculture. The weight of the cattle is stamped automatically on the weight ticket. Now, when the cattle come off the scale, they are the property of the meat packer and are on their way to the plant itself, soon to become meat and many byproducts. One of the most important jobs in a meat plant is the constant inspection of all animals and meat, both by plant experts and by the highly trained men of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Each side of beef is carefully cleaned with a high-pressure water spray. The beef sides are wrapped in a protective cloth and moved to a chill room or cooler. In the chill room, the temperature is kept just above freezing. It takes about 36 hours to chill the beef thoroughly and bring the meat to the temperature which will best preserve its freshness and flavor. From this point on, until the meat is sold in the food store, the temperature is never allowed to rise more than a few degrees. The government inspection stamp is placed where it will appear on the rib, round and other wholesale cuts. Before the beef is shipped, the sides are cut in half. It is at this time that our graders grade the meat and the brand name is applied to the beef quarters. Lamb gets treatment similar to beef, except that the carcass is left whole and not separated into sides or quarters. Veal is also handled in a like manner, except that in order to protect the color and quality of the delicate meat, the skins are left on until just before shipment. In the case of pork, the meat packing plant does the job of dividing the carcass into about 120 different cuts or items. Hams are graded according to weight and quality. Some will be shipped as fresh hams, but most of them will be cured and then smoked. 30 or 40 hours in hardwood smoke 
bring out their color and wonderful flavor. By maintaining quality and creating public acceptance, the meat packer performs a real service to producers of America's livestock. The meat packer performs these services for earnings that are among the smallest of all American industries. Department of Agriculture reports show the meat packer's average earning over a 23 year period was 16 cents per hundred pounds of livestock handled. Saying it another way, this profit averages a fraction of a cent a pound on all products sold by the meat packer. These earnings, which average 16 cents per hundred pounds of livestock, have practically no effect upon the prices producers receive for their livestock or the prices consumers pay for meat. On the pork cutting line, bacon is graded and branded according to special quality standards just the same as hams. Also like hams, bacon sides are smoked after proper curing in a mixture of sugar, salt and other ingredients. 70% or more of the live weight of a hog is made into edible products of great variety. Sliced and packaged bacon is one of the most popular. To satisfy the huge American appetite for sausage, much of the pork is ground up, seasoned and made into the familiar links. Also, pork is blended with beef and other meats and goes into all kinds of fancy sausages and a whole family of table-ready meats. The Frank, that American favorite, is made by the millions to satisfy the desires of both young and old. Fat is used to make lard and other shortenings. The making of useful articles from materials once thought useless is extremely important in the economics of the livestock and meat industry. The wool that comes into the plants on millions of lambs each year is taken off the skins after chemical treatment has loosened the fibers. Wool, like many other byproducts, is sold to the manufacturers of hundreds of useful articles. Cattle hides are cured in piles with salt carefully spread between each hide. Later they will go to tanning plants and find useful life in shoes, leather belting and luggage and a few go into harness and saddles. The lambskins too are carefully graded and processed for sale to the tanners. Quite often, the packer pays more for cattle than he can get for the meat. At such times, the meat packer must depend on byproducts to pay the expense of buying, handling and slaughtering the livestock, refrigerating, loading, shipping and selling the meat, and to provide some of the money necessary to pay producers for their livestock. There remains the problem of getting meat from the plants to the millions of consumers. Normally, two methods of distribution are used. Many retail food stores in towns and cities can be serviced best by direct shipment from plants. Salesmen cover plant and city sales routes, making frequent and regular calls on these retailers and relay the orders to the plant. Cars or trucks are loaded and started on their individual routes to supply a whole series of towns with meat, dairy and poultry products. The second method of distribution is through branch houses, generally located in large consuming centers. The branch houses receive their meats, dairy and poultry products and other foods from the various plants to supply the retail food stores. The branch houses advise the company's central office by teletype of the amounts and grades of beef, lamb, veal and pork they need. The meat and dairy and poultry plants on the other hand tell the central office how much product they have on hand that is not needed in their local territories. In the central office a group of experienced men balance the quantities of products at the plants against the needs of the branch houses. 
These men at the loading table represent the beef, pork, and other departments of the meatpacking business. Their job of matching supply and demand is complicated by the fact that consumers in different areas have very different preferences and want varying types of beef, pork, veal, and lamb. For example, Chicago consumers prefer beef which comes from animals that weigh 750 to 850 pounds, while Boston wants its beef from cattle weighing 1,300 to 1,500 pounds. Philadelphia consumers like beef cuts so there will be no ribs on the hind quarter, while Boston people want three ribs on the hind quarter. These men know all the ins and outs of preferences in the different parts of the nation and consider them when arranging the movement of products from the plants. Each man is responsible for getting the products of his department moved from the plants to the branch houses. Competition between them for space in refrigerator cars or refrigerated trucks is keen. For instance, Brooklyn may want half a carload of beef, so they decide to load that car at the Omaha plant. But Brooklyn also has to have 2,000 pounds of pork loins. Omaha is short of loins. St. Joe has both the kind of pork and beef Brooklyn wants. So they switch the order from Omaha to St. Joe. There's plenty of competition here. Each man has a job to do, and once in a while they... Well, let's listen in. Now, I can't handle it. I can't get my premium potatoes. How about the morning? Uh, I got 8,000 PA. Well, wait a bit now. How much weight are you guys going to expect to get in this car? I got 10,000 land for Fort Worth. I have 8,000 of veal. Well, how much you got at Omaha? I got 15,000 pounds of Joe. Well, I want, I want Omaha. Omaha. Oh, how much weight of beef we want in the car? Finally, the day's cars are all scheduled for loading, and the orders to ship are quickly sent to all the plants. Once again, meat is on the move. Refrigerator cars are loaded with the efficiency that is a necessary part of any meat packing plant operation. Dairy, poultry, and other products are stacked on the floor until the car is loaded to capacity. This efficiency of shipping and also selling various products at the same time benefits both producers and consumers. In serving large centers of population, the branch house is a combination of warehouse, refrigerator, and wholesale market. Here, one of the most important jobs is to break down the beef quarters, the lambs and veal into cuts retail dealers require. Often special cuts are made for hotel and restaurant trade. Some retail meat dealers come in person to the branch houses to select the quantities and quality of meat they know will satisfy their customers. They bargain vigorously over price because there are no price tags on the meat in the branch house any more than on the live animals in the stockyards. Here the price is affected by the same influences of supply and demand which operate when the livestock producer offers his animals for sale. Too much meat results in lower prices. Too little meat means an increase in prices. Not all the dealers shop in person, so branch house salesmen cover regular territories calling on dealers to sell them their meats, poultry, and dairy product needs. Under these two flexible systems of distribution, plant sales routes and branch houses, prices for livestock and other agricultural products are governed by a matching of supply and demand all over the United States. The meat business moves fast. It has to, for meat is perishable. Consumers want it fresh and attractive. Nationwide meat packers make it possible for all kinds of meat to be available at most any point in the United States. Every housewife in every city, town, and village in the nation can buy the kind of meat she wants whenever she wants it. Every task of the livestock and meat packing industry is geared to move meat quickly, efficiently, and continuously over its average travel of more than a thousand miles. The United States is a country of vast distances, so large meat packing concerns are needed to do the job of bringing producers of livestock and consumers of meat together. <laughs>